Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the council meeting on July 25th, 2023 at the time of one o'clock. I will call the meeting to order and remind everybody that at two o'clock today, council will enter into a public meeting to consider an application for a zoning bylaw amendment. I'll now read our land acknowledgement. We respectfully, uh, we respectfully acknowledge that the township of Asphodel Norwood is located on the Treaty 20 Mississauga Treaty and the traditional Treaty of the Mississauga and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include, they include Curb Lake, Hiawatha, Alterville, Scugog Island, Rama, Bozali, and Georgina Island First Nations. The Township of Asphodel Norwood respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain their responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. And I'll now invite everybody to pause for a moment of silent reflection to prepare for the council meeting ahead as a gesture of respect and contemplation. I will now ask council members to declare any pecuniary interest if they have any matter before the council to state the interest now or at the time of the matter arises. Seeing none, we'll move, we'll move ahead with the agenda. Approval of the agenda, I'll ask for a motion to approve today's agenda as amended with the circulated addendums. Moved by uh, Deputy Mayor Burt, second by Councillor Ward. Any discussion? All in favor? Motions carried. Um, moving along to consent. No. Minutes, please. Minutes. No, sorry. Business arising from the minutes. Uh, I need an approval of the minutes, please. A motion. Can I have a motion for approval of the minutes, please? Councillor Walsh. Councillor Ward. Discussion. No. As presented. As presented. Right. All in favor of that? Motions carried. On to the consent agenda. I'm looking for a motion to approve correspondence for information. Uh, C1, I think, is one to hold. Uh, discussion on C1, C2, C3, C4, C7, and 8. Uh, looking for approval of those, and then we'll have discussion. R's too. Sorry. Do you want all the R's done at the same time in special events and everything? Yeah, so um, okay. the motion would be to approve uh, C1 through C4, um, four. then we have C7 and C8 Eight. that um, we could add to the consent as well, that's fine. Um, staff reports are one to five, and then the minutes of the special event and the Trump heritage Trump. committee. Um, those would be adopted with my motion through consent. So if you get a movement seconder on the floor, then they can pull what they want. Okay. Everybody. I will move with a comment after seven. Yeah, uh, Deputy Mayor Bird and Councillor Walsh. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bird. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to pull a couple C7 and C8. C7, C8. And uh, if I may, for you, Mayor, um, also C1. And C1. The first quarter staff reports are all right. That's R1 through 5. And the special events committee minutes from June 6th and the cultural and heritage committee minutes from June 13th is circulated. So is uh, everybody in favor of that then with those three poll? Yeah, so let's okay. just allow them to have their discussion. Yeah. Okay. C7 and 8. C yeah. Three. We'll start with C7. Okay. Um, so those both C7 and C8 were um, very in all those accounts of those folks um, uh, liaison reports. So C7, um, Councillor Walsh, just I noticed um, you had both showcasing Canada Day and the, the events there. 
Um, showcase looks to be really good. Canada Day maybe a bit of struggle, and I'm just wondering. They're really close within a couple of weeks of each other. So I just, I just wondered because unfortunately I had to miss both. Um, I just wanted to wonder if one speak to those. Yeah, certainly can. Uh, screen mirror. Yes. Um, yeah, because we had showcase on June seventeenth, and then only two weeks later we had Canada Day. So they they were close together. <coughs> Many has looked at whether they need to separate them a little bit more uh, going forward. I think secondly. Some of the learnings from post Canada Day is when Canada Day falls on the weekend, people's weekends are very valuable to them. And then finding that people just don't want to give up part of the day, yeah. come, even though it's a local event to, to be at. If I compare that to last year when Canada Day I think it was on a Friday, we had a significant crowd here. So I think that part of it plays into the other piece that Canada Day that we discussed is the fireworks piece. Um, the, part of the challenge becomes we have everybody gathered here all up in the day. Uh, we lost part of the day this year because of, of rain. But then people go home, and then there's this opportunity to come back and, and watch fireworks at night. And it's expensive. It's a big chunk of budget that was used for fireworks. And the committee kind of discussed if it had been a normal year, we would have had have lots of fireworks. They did cancel the work because of the fire ban. The word went also with fireworks, hastened with fireworks. And the thought among the committee was do we need all three of us competing for fireworks? And I'll be honest, hastens a spectacular fireworks, I think partially because it's on the water. So maybe something for consideration next year, whether we take those funds and do something different with it versus having a fireworks display or, or look at having a Canada Day event. Maybe a breakfast piece and a fireworks piece, or more of a late afternoon, so people are kind of still here. Um, just some thoughts among the committee, but um, definitely need to make some changes for next year. Thank you. And CA? Uh, CA, um, Councillor Moore, you mentioned in well, a couple things um, your council breakfast, the BAC council breakfast. Um, I just wanted some more information on that, but that might be coming forward. And then I just want to let you know now. I'm not sure maybe May, Mayor Wilford had mentioned it at um, the last um, county council meeting, uh, Community Futures uh, Pedro was there and they had mentioned that they have a community economic development fund and part of that can be for municipalities for grant funding for startups to support business and that sort of thing. Okay. Do you remember the amount? I, I want to say 12. For some reason, seven thousand sticks in my mind, but also twelve thousand. So I'm not sure the amount, but it, it's it's to help promote business. And I don't know whether the township has ever used something like that. I didn't know anything about it, so I'm just passing that along to Candace to follow because you're on that committee. Um, so that might be something to look into. Maybe you know the farmers market or some way to support business. Um, and it. It, I looked on the website and it said something about, um, you know, apply. I, I think they take applications all the way through the year, but I think they only have so many dollars per year. So um, I think it's something worth looking into. If it's not this year, it can be another year. So I think it's, I think it's something to, to look into. So I just wanted to pass that along as well. Um, yeah, thank you for that information. Mm -hmm. I'll look into that further yeah. because, you know, we, that is the mandate of the BAC exactly. is to you know, look at getting, establishing a farmers and artisan market. And if we can, you know, help this you know, right. happen by, yeah. you know, some funding, that would be awesome. Um, the other part of your question, I believe, was about the proposal. And this is a, this is an ask from the uh, VAC to council. And I think maybe we should maybe um, defer it to general business. General. Um, yeah. That uh, about a potential um, of having a council breakfast for the business uh, community and um, that we would host it as counselors and, and mayor, of course, mayor, deputy mayor, uh, and maybe some thoughts on dates, times, and uh, Candace, I think, has been in the loop with this, so I'm sure she could give some feedback of mm -hmm. how South would like to proceed. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. yeah, that's... Would be yeah, no, I, I saw discussion. that in your report and I thought, oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. so right. maybe we can discuss it in general. In general. That, mm -hmm. that sounds fine. Thank you. And we'll move on to C1. Yeah, C1, it's just a, a comment. Um, I 
I think that, as always, all the reports are really great. Um, but in particular, the library, the public library, uh, they have been doing some really great community uh, events and the outreach programs. And if you look at June, I don't even know how they fit everything into June, like yeah. because we're only open I think like, it was a few days, days and hours so, yeah. per um, per week. And uh, I just want to pass on to I believe you're on the committee council or uh, uh, deputy mayor um, that uh, pass on the the good work to the library uh, staff because I think they're going over and beyond. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Um, and can I add to that? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I certainly let them know they're working very hard. I think they have 30 some kids signed up for the summer reading program as well. So that's it's huge. A lot. So thankfully, it's in Westwood because then they have yeah. the park inside as well. Wow. Yeah. Um, actually, I was speaking with a librarian this morning, and she just let me know that, um, as uh, our CAO had mentioned, that the Hero Child and Family Center is um, able to have space in the Norwood branch. So that Sort of the library end of the move was completed over the weekend. So between township staff and library staff and volunteers, they were able to move the children's section downstairs where the, where the Wednesday and Friday morning um, events will be held for the um, Pedro Family Center. And then they were able to move all of the um, books I think there were nonfiction books from downstairs upstairs. So that's a big move. Like that's a lot of material. So she just wanted to send that out to thank the township staff and all the volunteers who helped because it was very much appreciated. So that part of the, the move is done. Um, an agreement has not been signed yet because of holidays, but that will happen before they before they start up. So uh, I think they're going they're going to try it for a year. We'll see how it goes. I'm sure um you know, once it gets going, there'll be a further reports coming in the fall. Any other questions? So all in favor of those reports then? And we have no delegation today, so we'll move on to staff reports. Uh, Peter, would you care to discuss our state story? <clears throat> All right, thank you uh, for you, Mayor. So this report is regarding uh, pedestrian uh, crossing reviews. Um, so uh, the review was completed as a result of resident feedback and concerns um, and challenges that we are having recruiting crossing guards um, and ensuring that the locations are compliant with current legislation as well. So when determining uh, whether a location is suitable for crossing guards or not, there, there is a guideline that we use to follow and it was produced by the Ontario Traffic Council specifically for um, um, determining whether a crossing guard is needed or not. Um, and it should be noted that this uh, guideline has referenced the Highway Traffic Act and the Ontario Traffic Manual as well. Um, you can see in the definition section here that um, we we define what a crossing guard is in here um, and what a what certain types of crossovers are. I won't go through them all, or sorry, what certain types of crossings are, but I won't go through them all as you as you can see there. Um, but I will highlight the crossing guard one. Uh, which is a person 16 years or older um, who is directing the movement of persons as defined in the Highway Traffic Act across a highway by creating necessary gaps in vehicular traffic and to provide safe gaps for the passage of um, students and pedestrians. So the criteria for determining whether a school crossing guard is needed or not um, may exhibit different characteristics, including student and victim vehicular volumes, mm -hmm. posted speed limits, topography, driving patterns, and the mix of the vehicle types. So heavy traffic, heavy truck traffic, cars, that sort of thing. Um, sight lines may also be a factor as well. Um, the Ontario Traffic Council recommends the combination of a thorough site inspection of the local context and warrant evaluation process when determining if a school crossing guard is needed at a specific location. The warrant evaluation process is the application of appropriate 
uh, warrant process in order to evaluate the need for a school crossing guard. Site inspections would be the first step we take, um, and they would include things like identifying and assessing apparent hazards um, at a potential school crossing location. And the report would contain information about the site, um, you know, what, what's the traffic like, that sort of thing. What are the site lines like? Um, once it's been determined that other alternatives such as pedestrian crossovers, um, intersection pedestrian signals, or mid-block pedestrian signals are not sufficient to provide a safe student crossing, then a school crossing work guard warrant evaluation for us process needs to be completed. There are two uh, types of warrant methods you can use. Uh, one is the exposure index method and one is the gap study method. Mm -hmm. The exposure index method focuses on volumes and volumes of students and vehicles and was initially uh, created uh, for railway crossings, but was later on converted to be used for school, guard, school crossing guards. Um, and they are, they are tailored for all-way stop controls or signal control crossings, um, that type of thing. The gap, gap stop method is uh, an objective means of evaluating whether there is enough safe, safe gaps in traffic uh, for students to cross. Uh, but it's not suitable for fully controlled intersections. So traffic signals would not apply for that, for that warrant evaluation. So for the purposes of the, this review, uh, staff use the uh, stop gap method um, because we have we were looking at mid block crossings and uh, way stop crossings um, for this particular uh, instance. So school crossing guards can only be implemented if the speed is less than sixty kilometers an hour. Um, quantitative and qualitative data are needed to complete the school crossing guard warrant at an all-way stop controlled intersection. Qualitative data, or sorry, quantitative data includes conflicting vehicular volumes, number of students crossing at each leg of the intersection during school peak periods, uh, vehicle speeds, and note if any conflicting vehicular volumes include heavy vehicles. Qualitative data includes aggressive or indecisive drivers, poor driver behavior, and whether students appear timid in the crossing or not. And in addition to the qualitative and quantitative data, the both methods, um, both methods use that type of data. At mid-block locations, motorists have the right of way on the road opposed to signalized or unsignalized intersections. Thus, students have to rely on the available gaps in traffic to cross the roadway safely. These there are two phases of the gap stop gap stop method, gosh, that's a mouthful, <laughs> where phase one is to establish the safe gap time, and the second phase is to survey the gaps available um, at the mid-block location or the stop control, and evaluate whether there are enough safe gaps or not. And the removal of a school crossing guard is very similar. Um, Removal of school crossing guard can be undertaken only after careful inspection and analysis of the existing school crossing guard location to verify that the student safety would not be compromised by the removal of the guard. However, there may be instances where the need to reevaluate school crossing guard location should be undertaken based on the following factors. Vehicle or student patterns have changed. A significant increase in the number of students being driven or taken to school by buses or cars, and requests for a reassessment from the school, municipality, or the public. So, in this instance, it was a request from um, residents and municipality. Currently, in the township, we have uh, two crossing guard uh, locations one at Counter Road 45 and Industrial Drive, and the other one at Counter Road 45 and Spring Street. Uh, staff have received concerns from residents regarding the Florida Street intersection as also being noted that there is minimal, should also be noted that there is minimal pedestrian traffic at the Industrial Drive crossing. And for these reasons, we completed a reassessment for the removal um, of the Industrial Drive, Drive crossing and the implementation at Flora and Queen Street. We staff used the gap study method 
combined with the site inspections for this assessment. So in the first stage was to observe the number of groups of five students that cross at a given location. During the observation, staff noted that on average, one group of five students or less crossed at each, cross at each location. It should be noted that an average of only six students in total cross at Industrial Drive and only four students in total cross at Flora Street and nine students cross at Queen Street during the morning and afternoon time frame. So these were during peak times uh, when you would normally see students crossing. And at no point during the observations were there more than a group of three students combined crossing at any given time. Then the next step is to, once we gather that information, is to calculate the, the safe gap time required. Um, and given that there's only one group observed, the safe gap time is calculated at 13.1 seconds for all locations. And since there's only one group of students on average crossing at each location, the required number of safe gaps for one to five groups is two safe gaps for every five minute interval. So in the charts below, you can see what the results of the study uh, was. Um, we'd like to note that, and I won't go through all those, uh, I highlighted them in the conclusion there. Um, it should be noted that we'll continue to monitor these locations and reassess needs based on the results of, of reviews. Um, other areas uh, may be considered in the future, such as County Road 40 uh, between Bridge and Wellington and Highway 7 at Victoria Street. Financial impact, the cost of the recommendations was not included in the 2023 budget. Staff is recommending that the estimated cost of $17,550 be funded from the road equipment reserve to implement the, the uh, pedestrian crossings. Based on the calculations and review, a crossing guard would be required at Industrial Drive. However, it is known that traffic volumes are high on County Road 45, given it is a class three road, and typically class three roads have an annual average daily traffic of 3,000 to 3,999 cars per day. On average, six students cross at this location. Therefore, a pedestrian crossover would be appropriate at this location. High traffic volumes decrease the number of safe traps. Therefore, it is safe to assume if the traffic volumes were lower and with only six students utilizing the crossing, a crossing guard would not be required. Staff recommend that cross that the crosswalk be relocated between the two entrances Maple uh, Retirement Group um, residence, opposed to an industrial drive. We feel like this is going to be a safer location. And below, I, I do have a picture here attached in the report of what the crossover would look like with the signs and flashing lights. And from the calculations and observations at the Queen and Street and Flora Street intersection, a crossing guard is not required based on the results of the, of the review. Staff recommend that a ladder crosswalk be installed at these locations, giving pedestrians the right of way at the stop condition. Uh, the recommendation, the, the recommended scope of work at each location expected is expected to be completed before the end of the year. And as we noted before, we'll continue to monitor the current locations and look at um, new locations such as County Road 40 and Highway 7 at Victoria Street. That's the end of my report. Council, you've seen the recommended motion in your agenda package. Uh, do I have somebody to make the motion or do you want me to read the motion out? Peter pretty well said it all right there. <laughs> I'll make the motion. Moved by Councillor Walsh. Second. With with a question. Count second by Councillor uh, Gre Hodge Greaves. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Peter. Uh, some questions around the Queen Street Flora Street intersection. There is a stop sign, correct? Uh, as Flora comes to Queen. There's two stops. Yeah. Thank and you. And then there's there. the other one on 45. There's. Yeah, so if you're coming out to 45, there's yeah. a stop sign at Queen and at 45, yeah. as well as at Flora. At Flora. Thank you. So it's kind of like a three-way stop there. Yeah, and then the traffic off of 45 has no stop condition. That's correct. Right. So the proposal is to have a ladder crosswalk across Queen Street this way, 
and then from Flora Street to like the parking lot at the Presbyterian Church. Yeah, because there it was noticed that some pedestrians do cross the parking lot and then cross Flora Street. So yeah, we can see some benefit to having yeah. that there as well. Um, is there thoughts to putting markings so people don't block that section? Because I forgot there was a stop sign because people tend to blow through the one on Flora before you get to 45. Right. And my concern is that should there be markings that people are not allowed to stop between that stop sign? There's only the spot for one vehicle. So what ends up happening is you have one bus and then three, like, and then a car, and another bus, and then there's no, they're not on the stop sign. There's no space for the children to actually use the crosswalk because people block the intersection. And then the people from Queen can't get out either because they're blocked in front of it. Is there a way? I'm just trying to understand your question. So completely. my question is, is there a way that we can try and get people to stop blocking the Queen Street coming out? Because right now people from Flora, like is- So if they're coming out of Flora, they stop yeah. at Flora and Queen and then they continue on to 45 yeah. and stop again. But between those two stop it's, signs- People will stop as opposed to waiting at the stop signs. It's, it's is mostly there, because of volume of traffic. Yeah. Um, like, there isn't any way we can really. Is there no markings you can say? Because like well, in the big cities, they have like do not stop in this part of the intersection. Is that a possibility? No, not no. really, because I don't think then um, the traffic flow would be continuous enough if you don't allow anybody to to sit there for a short period of time. Yeah, I mean, it, I get it, but it's just. Yeah, I guess there's just not the space. Because like, that's the issue with kids trying to cross. The ladder crosswalk and the stop block will be set up such that it can't be blocked. <laughs> okay, so people should not be stopping on the ladder that's crosswalk. Correct. That's correct. No. Okay, that's so the amazing. people should not be stopping on the ladder crosswalk, which will be in front of the stop sign across Flora Street. That's correct. And it's in, so the stop sign's here, the crosswalk is, it's not here, right? It's here. It's, it would be behind the behind stop sign. sign. That's correct. Okay. Yep. All right. And enrollment is increasing dramatically at the public school. And are you planning on reobserving in the fall to see what the volumes are like? Thank you, Sir Mayor. Yeah, we definitely will be continuing to monitor these locations to, to ensure that changes um, don't require us to have a crossing guard there or other alternatives. Okay, so we can't magically make people not stop, but the crosswalk should hopefully keep people from stopping and blocking the yep. crosswalk. I mean, we can't control what I know you can't do, control. But, 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 don't do what you're saying, Peter. Um, <laughs> but but yes. yes, effectively, okay. they would not be able to block block the crosswalk the way it's set up. So hopefully, it'll slow the block. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for indulging me. Right? No problem. I appreciate that and. Thank you for the I question. go there twice every day in the season, and I can't believe I forgot there was a stop sign. So. <laughs> Council Moore. Fine. Mm -hmm. thank yes, you. thank you through you, Manager Peter. Uh, and a good report, Peter. I, I just have two questions. Um, one are is the one that will be on forty five. Is that portable? Like I see, and and are they solar? Like um, thank you through Mayor. They're not portable. They're actually permanent. Um, I just saw the little things on top, so I wasn't sure if they were solar generated. They are. They are solar powered. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the second part. So the, the cost initially is seventeen thousand five hundred and fifty, but if we're if there's no payment for a crossing guard, that money will be recaptured sure. in future years. Like you know, the cost is initially put out, but you know we're we're going to recoup <coughs> that because it's going to be longevity. That's correct. And the other thing in the report, I was happy to see that. Uh, you guys will continue to look at Ridge Street on uh, like yep. because I know that that has in the past been a question posed to me from residents of the children trying to get across that uh, section. So I'm happy that you guys are going to continue to look at that section as well. But anyways, thank you. Candice? Uh, just a couple of things. So wanted to highlight the Ridge Street. Um, what we're finding is the children are not utilizing the lights are coming down through the old Victoria Street extension. And then what, since they're able to, that pathway exists for um, pedestrian connectivity and when they closed up the street, they turned it into a walkway, which was great. But what that does is it creates the path of least resistance as human beings we take. And so it isn't funnel, it's forcing 
the, giving the kids an alternative instead of them using the intersection that's actually controlled and safe, they're crossing seven at Victoria. And as the subdivisions are coming more to the north, that's funneling more, more children. And, and although it may not be um, ideal from a connectivity, you know, for people to utilize from a health and safety perspective, it makes more sense. Even if you're coming downtown to shop or to utilize the services downtown, you should be coming to the lights to utilize it and whether that connectivity, that pedestrian walkway, um, we need to take a look at that um, in the future and whether we need to uh, repurpose that area um, so it isn't so clearly a direct uh, a path to cross seven through there. Um, secondly, um, just wanna highlight at the police services board meeting that we're having on Thursday, we need to talk about those um, new crossings. We should bring that up at the police services board so that they know when they're installed, that they do some patrol at that intersection come September, just with new markings, new controls, um, the police need to have a presence there. And three, we are, once council has approved today's approach, we're gonna be sending some educational materials through the schools um, come September that there has been some um, mitigation measures put in place to assist with pedestrian and vehicular uh, traffic um, at the school location. And to just remind parents and the school to have conversations uh, with the children as well to ensure that they're aware of what those markings mean, um, why they're there, um, to remind motorists why they're there. And there's a huge education piece to this as well to try to assist with closing the loops. We can paint things on the ground, but if people don't have an understanding and children um, that are walking to school at 10 years of age aren't going to have exposure necessarily maybe to what those markings mean and why they need to cross there versus, you know, a little bit before, a little bit after. So um, township staff is going to get something out, uh, website, social media, and then circulate through the schools and then potentially ask the schools um, in ways that maybe we can assist with educating the parents and the children and the bus drivers and whether we need to have the OPP go over and do an educational session with all of those uh, demographics just to try to assist with, um, assist with it. Because I think there's, no matter what we do, Unless there's that piece behind it, um, we're we're not going to hit the mark that we're trying to hit. So that's it for me. Thank you, Council Wolf. No comments. I can't put in there. Um, so the Spring Street School Crossing Guard will remain there. That's okay. Right. And then the second one, I I do like the recommendation on the movement of the one on Forty Five up to Maple Leaf for a couple of reasons. One is it does get away from Industrial Drive, but there is. Yep. And it's also nice for people in Mapleview that want to cross, cross yes. more safely. And it also will help with some speed reduction. Yeah, so that's right. There's a lot of great purposes. So thank you. What's that in there, Bert? Uh, yeah, through you there. Um, it's interesting how you mentioned the education piece because I think that I think that's huge. I was in Hastings the other day and they caught the new one there by kind of where the old banjos is with the lights. Yeah. And there were two or three kids on bikes and um, they were waiting and waiting and I had stopped. All the other cars coming the other way weren't stopping. Oh. And they were throwing up their hands. I was half tempted to jump out and you know play crossing guard because I'm thinking, come on people, like the lights are, the signs are there. So it's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And thankfully the kids know enough to make sure the cars stop. stop. But um, you know, kids get distracted. It's summertime, they're they're busy, they hit that button, they want to cross. Mm -hmm. And um, it can, yeah, it, it's a risk. So it's yeah. it's a huge education piece for drivers and they just need to pay attention. So mm -hmm. anyway, that was just my comment. Okay. We have a mover and seconder. We've had discussion. All in favor of the motion. That motion's carried. <laughs> Moving on to our seven surface treatment plan. Peter, please continue. All right. Uh, thank you for your merit. Uh, so this report is regarding the uh, five-year surface treatment plan. So our current plan expires uh, with the completion of 2023. And so a new five-year plan needs to be developed. Uh, so the 2024 to 2028 surface treatment plan will represent the fourth cycle of the plan. Uh, so the plans have proven to be invaluable um, when it comes to budget forecasting and long-term long planning. 
but it will also ensure that the township is compliant with Ontario Regulation 588-17 and the requirement to, to develop level of service to support the asset management plan uh, for all core municipal infrastructure assets. So this five-year cycle will focus primarily on maintenance and preventative measures, uh, preventative measures, <laughs> in order to mitigate uh, premature degradation of road surfaces and to improve the pavement condition index, which is basically the ride or the feel of the road. It will also ensure the life cycle of the asset is maximized. Um, and just to note, the cycle of a surface tree to road typically is a duration of 10 years. And during that 10 year period, every three to five years, uh, we should be completing a maintenance layer in order to maximize that life cycle. Um, I would also like to note that the roads need study was uh, referenced uh, to help provide the basis of the plan. So we have approximately 52.23 kilometers of surface treated roads in the township um, as of right now, at a current replacement value of $3,436,734. That does not include anything like ditching or anything like that. That's just for the surface treatment. So as you can see, um, there's a number of tables here following uh, for each consecutive year from 2024 to 2028, indicating uh, which road we'll be applying a maintenance layer to or what type of work we'll be doing um, and the associated cost or estimated cost. I won't go through them in detail. Um, the financial implications, the capital surface treatment project costs will be provided within the corresponding budget year for approval. And the following table uh, summarizes our 2024 to 2028 surface treatment plan. Um, so over the next five years, uh, we have an estimated cost of $1.8 million to implement the plan. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the five-year treatment plan will provide council staff direction over the next five years regarding the maintenance and rehabilitation of our surface treatment inventory. And as we noted, we have approximately 52 kilometers um, valued at just over $3.4 million. And as noted, this plan would um, inject $1.8 million over the next five years. And that's the conclusion of my report. Council, you've seen the recommended motion in the agenda package. Do I have someone to make a motion? Uh, Councillor or Deputy Mayor Burt and seconder Councillor Hodge Greaves. Another question. Discussion. Um, thank you, Peter. You know I love roads. Um, question. So, for example, in 2024, to put a new surface treat, double layer surface treatment on Asphalt 8 line, it costs approximately $163,000. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, that, that is correct. And how long does that last? A uh, typical life cycle of a surface treatment road is 10 years. 10 years. And for 10 years of maintaining a gravel road, what is the cost of that? Is it less, more? Well, it would be less. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the costs are. Um, it really depends on the year, how much rain we get, that sort of thing. Um, but it would be less than that. Over the 10 year span? Yes. So I guess this is my, so why do we keep service street in the roads? That's my question. I don't, if it costs more money for the same amount of time, why are we service treating our roads? Well, we surface treat them so that we, I mean, the, the grader is a piece of equipment that's very expensive to maintain. Yeah. Um, and they're very expensive to replace. So we're, we're trying to uh, improve our roads by surface treating them and use the grader less, hopefully over time and hopefully extend the life of it. Yeah. Um, and it gives the road a better ride. Um, I know it costs more, but it's a better ride and it's a lot less maintenance. It frees us up to do other um, operations throughout the year that, that are becoming more in need. Um, so I was going to question you on that, on that Peter. Yeah. If it is a lot cheaper over a 10-year cycle, by the time you look at maintenance, upkeep, everything that's going into it. Yeah, it's hard to say. Like, I don't know the cost of the plan, yeah. but I'm, I'm just making assumptions. Right. Um, 
So, I, so I, to maintain a gravel road does require more, more regular maintenance of it, and it's harder to snow plow. Is it those types of things? Well, when it comes to snow plowing, it doesn't really make a difference on the type of the road, but it does make a difference on what type of winter maintenance activity we'd be doing, um, because gravel roads react differently than surface trees mm -hmm. roads depending on the weather. Yeah. Um, but it does, it does free us up to do other things. Um, if we're not outgrading and that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, Councillor Kurt, or Thank Deputy Mayor Kurt. Uh, yeah, just um, in 2026, the, the Birdsall um, road segment, I just wanted to, to uh, confirm Aspinall Norman looks after the Birdsall line, uh, center line south, yes. and then OSM looks after center line north, correct? I believe is that's that the, correct. Is that the agreement? That's, okay. That's correct, yeah. I, I just wanted to, to check that because I know with the Duro Dummer, it's shared um, yeah. when you do that that road. So so that's the agreement you have with OSM. That's correct. Okay. Birds all would also be a shared cost. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is a share cost. It, it is, share although cost. just who is the operating authority oh, okay. is different, but, oh, but okay. still okay. Yeah. okay, thank you, thank you. And then I have one more question. Oh, so total estimated cost over the five years is one point eight million, give yeah. or take. Um, and that's in today's dollars, correct? That does that include a little bit of inflation each year? We did. From, we did include some inflation. You did. Okay. Yes. Okay. I wasn't but, sure whether. I know. Yeah. You, let's face it. The lot. The way it's been the last two three yeah. years. Good luck. Yeah. These these numbers but, would be finalized in the current budget yes, year that no, we're I know, coming. I know. Um, because we, we we can only predict as much as we can. Right. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't know if a little bit of inflation was included. Or yes. Not. So thank you. That's all I had. Councillor War. Yeah. Thank you for you. Uh, to Peter. Um. Yeah, I, I had the same question about the, the boundary and the responsibilities, but um, the second one I had, and I think it was maybe a previous report, but um, the new regs for the ditching and draining um, for the reg 555, like, and I'm just, soil. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's the access soil management. And I was just wondering, like, I know it's just new, um, but I was wondering if you could briefly out line what this is what you're experiencing right now uh, I know that it will probably be in a learning curve uh thank you three Mary it, it definitely is a bit of a learning curve for every municipality in Ontario right now I'm trying to figure out how to navigate this new regulation for excess soil management but we are working through it um and we will be bringing a report to council later this year um, to give you kind of the full rundown of what we expect to do under this regulation um but I Basically, all I can say is that it, it regulates what we can do with any excess soil and ditching material would be considered excess soil under the regulation. So we have to determine, you know, where we can take it, essentially, if that's what it boils down to. Would it fall under kind of the same thing that um, happens now with uh, like snow removal with the excess salt, you know, kind of, you know, like where it's going to drain? Is that part of the um, puzzle or no? The regulation does touch on that, but it's more geared towards the contamination of the soil um, and how that is dealt with and where that soil needs to go based on what's in it. I just noticed it in yeah. your report, so I just wanted to ask thank yeah. you for that explanation. No problem. Yeah. For sure. Did you have a question? And a couple of follow ups. So thank you, Mayor. There it will in this regulation will increase the cost yes. of all of these plans. Um, specifically, so when we hire a contractor to complete a, a scope of work, it is now a um, consideration in every contract we enter into and every tender document that we put out for construction is how is that excess soil, excess soil going to be managed? And we have to pay, it says right in the reg, we have to pay professional engineers to come up with a plan yeah. to determine how the excess soil is managed and what site it can go to. I think fortunately we have entrepreneurs in our area of the province who are aware of this regulation and are trying to stay ahead of it as in being uh, the site that is willing to take this soil or we have to take a look at other locations in the township in which we can take this soil ourselves depending on the testing of the soil depending on the use of the soil depending on where it came from where it's going it is just going to be a part of the conversation that traditionally 
we've never had to have before because um, most often than not our soil um, pre-regulation would be considered not contaminated right so it is definitely going to increase the cost of all of them, all of those efforts again when you come back to gravel versus surface treated road when we look at drainage and we look at ditching and we look at the ongoing maintenance of a road and when we ditch it we've had even concerns when we've ditched recent roads as to why are you making the ditches so much wider why are you making them so much deeper two things one we are always the 50-year storm, the 100 years from these massive storms that are happening. It's not when it's happening, it, it's when. They're happening now. And so those ditches have to be able to take a lot more water than traditionally they used to. And we may only get around the township every 15 years, you know, to ditch it. So it has to last that length of time. So if council is getting those questions, the ditching and drainage portion of this plan, and you're going to see that come forward in the fall in a separate plan all on its own, is a key piece. And that regulation report will tie into that ditching and drainage plan. Um, so those two, those two conversations uh, definitely, definitely yeah. go together. Right. Okay. Councilor right. Walsh. Sure to comment. Uh, three very nice actually builds on okay, what you said is when I first read the first time, oh man, we're not, we're not adding more rooks. Yeah. But we look at the cost associated, <laughs> we're lucky to be able to maintain what they have. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I think that's important that let's maintain what we have instead of adding more and not be able to really maintain them. And citing with that, we went through this with our training session with you and you just spoke to is ditching and draining is step one yeah. to making a successful road plan work. And I look forward to your, your report in the fall because we may be able to look at other roads, but that's step one. That we don't one. do that step one first. There's no sense. That's right. If we go to step two and step three, we're just basically short money anyway. So yeah. I'm very pleased with the report we have. Let's maintain what we have. That's not to say that we can't add uh, more roads down the road, but it's in the step of the Thank you, Sherman. Just on top of that, I, I just wanted to say like our budgets are getting taxed very much with increasing costs. So I think it's important that we continue to maintain what we have yeah. Um, yeah. instead of adding more until maybe our tax base uh, does increase and we're, we have the funds to, to add more roads to the surface treated. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very fair. Because I've, I've had people as a campus start to walk and talk and go, you know, surface treat our road. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot of process of adding another road. And yeah, as I've said, uh, as we've learned in continuing training is step one. So we don't have that done before we throw money away that we have Thank you. And to add on to that, Councillor Walsh, is that when the eighth line was identified or the third line previous to that, and the fact that we're not proposing anything new, those roads were strategically chosen. They're they're considered rural arterial roads. You know, they're going somewhere. The eighth line is a route to Hastings. You know, it goes into Hastings, past JJ Stewart. It, it is a main road. People want to buy past 45. It is a main, main route. It was identified for specific reasons, traffic count being one of them. Um, and also, we have one grader and we have one grader operator. And the storms and the climate change and how we get impacted every single time it rains is we can't, we can't keep up with all of it. And when you take a staff person that's dedicated in a grader for months and months on end, and they can only grade in between rains, and we seem to be getting more and more of them in more severe amounts of it. And then we get the complaints of, I've had damage to my car. This is washed out. I've lost my driveway. I can't do this. I can't do that. And the level of service that was created under the asset management plan reg was that we would have a certain amount of roads and we can get around them and grade them in a certain length of time. And to be able to, to do that, and as we know, our grader has not been kind to us on any stretch of the imagination. And to replace it, you're looking at 600,000 lost dollars. And that grader can only do, do so much. So. Thank you, Terry Mayor. I'd just like to add to the comment about the gravel roads too. Uh, the other thing we have to consider is the calcium for dust yeah. control. Um, those costs are going uh, up. creeping very high now too. So also I think another reason, we do get a lot of dust complaints, um, especially during the spring of the year. So I think it, it mitigates those dust complaints, mitigates the cost of, of grading, mitigates the cost of 
uh, calcium for dust control. So there's a lot of benefits to surface treating, and I, a lot of residents I think want it. As we've heard around the room, they they when you're canvassing, you hear well, why isn't my road surface treated? So um, I think there's a lot of different factors to look at. And I agree with maintaining what's there, a hundred percent. Yeah. Because yeah, I just on the surface if you yeah. And then I was thinking as well about the dust, yeah. which if you live near the road is, it is bad and it the is. calcium treatment of it. So no, I was just thinking about it. And you know, the third line has been done very well and it is, it is a good treatment and it doesn't, it, it, it is a good treatment. Um, and I'm looking forward to how they perform in the winter as well. Yeah. Maybe it'll be different with lack of ice, but yeah, no, I, and I 100% you have to maintain what's there. Otherwise, your $17,000 on Park Lane ends up being $75,000 in a bunch of other stuff. So I, I appreciate that. So thank you again, Peter. Yeah. And Candace. So is everybody in favor of that motion now that we've just shown the <laughs> I am <laughs> now. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for your time. Uh, we'll move on to uh, R9, a service agreement, the public library. Uh, Candace. Um, can no, we just do our eight? eight. Oh, did I not? I thought we, we got more roads to talk about. Sorry, more roads to talk, <laughs> but you're 100% correct. Sorry, Peter, R8, five year asphalt plan. Uh, thank you, Drew, Mayor. Uh, so, this report is regarding our five year asphalt plan, which will expire in the end of 2023. Uh, so the 2024-2028 so asphalt plan will be the second cycle of the plan. And the same can be said for this plan that uh, as the surface treatment plan is that it's invaluable when it comes to budget forecasting and long-term long planning. And also that ensures that the township is compliant with OREG 588-17 uh, for the requirement to develop levels of service to support the asset management plan for all core municipal assets. Um, so as noted before, the, the township's 2021 road needs study, along with site inspections of the asphalt road segments, provided uh, provided the basis basis for the recommendation laid out in the plan. Uh, the five years this five year cycle will focus primarily on maintenance and provide a major sim measures similar to the surface treatment plan um, uh, to. Uh, to prevent uh, degradation of the road surfaces and improve pavement condition index. It will also ensure that the life cycle of the asset is maximized. Um, it should be known that the life cycle of an asphalt road is typically 20 to 25 years. And during that term, maintenance should be completed every five to seven years, which will maximize the lifespan. We have approximately 27.23 kilometers of asphalt road in the township with an estimated replacement value of just over $6.5 million. And that does not include curb and gutter, storm sewer, or any infrastructure outside of the asphalt. Um, so similar to the surface treatment plan, uh, there's a bunch of tables here for each year listing the roads that we would complete uh, maintenance or reconstruction and the associated estimated cost. So financial implications, uh, the capital asphalt project cost will be provided with the corresponding budget year for approval, similar to the, to the surface treatment. And over the five years, we would implement $345,000 approximately uh, to the asphalt uh, services. Um, so in conclusion, uh, just as I noted, we have approximately 27 kilometers of roads with an estimated replacement value of just over 6.5 million. And over the next five years, we would implement 340 or just over $345,000 um, in the next five years for maintenance of these road, asphalt roads in this plan. And that concludes my report. Again, Council, you've seen the recommendation in your agenda package. Do I accept to make the motion? Walsh, Councillor Lodge Greaves. With a question. Quick one. Okay. Um, Wellington Street is listed for 2024 from County Road 40 to the dead end, which is the 
which is west. Cemetery entrance, yes. Yeah. Is there plans for the other direction as well? Uh, well, we do have a design ready uh, drawings, uh, but there is sewer upgrades for the, okay. the future subdivisions to be okay. completed first, so we wouldn't do any reconstruction no, until after that's all done. That's fine. I was just wondering about that. Thank you. That was it. Any other discussion? All in favor? That motion is carried. Now, Peter, I think you can. Thank you. <laughs> You're starting to sound like a librarian there reading a story. <laughs> Uh, services services agreement uh, public libraries for Candace. Well, we can see if we can get through it in five minutes. If not, we got the public meeting at uh, two, so I will see if I can get through it. Okay. Um. So what I'm asking for is council to enter into um, a service agreement um, between the township and the public library board. This is a slightly different approach that we've seen. Um. Traditionally, um, basically, it's going to outline all of the um, services that the township provides the library in regards to facilities, um, you know, treasury functions, um, the addition of the IT um, coordinator who started on Monday. Um, so, basically, I'm assuming that council has given the service and agreement a read um, to see what we're responsible for versus what the expectations of the library board are. Um, the librarian has reviewed it. I reviewed it went back and forth between the two of us and with council's blessing today. It'll be forwarded onto the library board and then all parties can um, execute uh, the agreement if council is in agreement. Um, this obviously, this agreement isn't inclusive of all of the interactions and day-to-day -day operations of either entity or the relationship between either entity, but outlines the, the bigger ones, the most significant um, issues between the two entities, because obviously they provide service out of buildings that they don't own, the municipality owns them. So it just kind of governs that relationship. Um, I don't have much more to say, Mayor, no, so I'll leave it with Council if they have any questions. I'm sure they've read it. Uh, yes. Um, do I have somebody to make a motion? Uh, Councillor or Deputy Mayor Bird, Councillor War, any discussion? No. All in favor? Our motion is carried. Uh, I'll have if I can get a motion to stand right now. It's almost two o'clock, and uh, we'll intervene after. Deputy Mayor Bird, Councillor Hodge Greaves, all in favor? Motion's carried. You got a few minutes there if anybody has to. Yes, please. Welcome, everybody, to our public meeting on July 25th to consider zoning bylaw amendment number ZBLA 01 2023. I will ask all the council of members if they have any pecuniary interest to declare them at this matter uh, or at the time of it, which is right now. Seeing no hands, we're all right. Um, I'm looking for a motion to approve the public meeting agenda as amended with the circulated addendum. Moved by Councillor Walsh. Second by Deputy Mayor Burt. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion is carried. Um, I'll now hand it over to Ed. Thank you. Chief Building Official, Planning Coordinator. Thank you. This uh, rezoning is required as a condition of consent from. Peterborough County Land Division, file B-172-22, and it creates a new residential lot surplus to the farming operations. This zoning bylaw amendment application said BLA-01-2023 is applicable to the lands described as 1552 Asphodel 8 line 
It's concession seven and it's part lot seven in the township of Aspidale and Norwood. The purpose and effect of the zoning bylaw amendment is to rezone the subject lands from an agricultural zone to an agricultural exception one zone. Also to, that's for the retained parcel of land. Also with a portion of it being rezoned to environmental protection EP zone. And then the separate portion will become rural residential. So the rezoning is required as a condition of the consent for that consent file B-172-22. And in order to protect the farmland and comply with the official plan and provincial policy statement, the township requires retained lands to be rezoned to agricultural exception one zone that it'll prohibit all residential uses on the farmland. Also require the uh, rezoning to rural residential for the separate parcel, the surplus dwelling. The environmental protection zone is a part of the addendum due to having uh, received late comments from the Autonomy Region Conservation Authority and applying the Schedule 4 map according to the Natural Heritage uh, mapping features that satisfies all of ORCA's concerns. Uh, there was some wooded area and some uh, wet area that was identified. And so we're taking care of that by rezoning it to environmental protection, EP zone. So that'll take care of that. Uh, if the uh, if we had received those comments ahead of time, we would have uh, just put it as a first one. There would have been no addendum, but it is what it is. The effect of the severance is to create a new residential lot that surplus to the farming operations. This farmhouse and property is not required as part of the farming operations, and the uh, farmer does not want to be a landlord. So, so that's the reason why he's severing off this residential lot. Uh, the attachments for the report was the uh, the zoning bylaw amendment application and the notice of complete application, notice of public meeting. We uh, had engagement with the public by posting the uh, complete application and the notice of the public meeting. As per the Planning Act, we've done it and then some uh, by putting it on our website, we placed two notices on the property, one on the rural piece of farmland property, one up at near the driveway entering onto the property. We've circulated everybody within 120 meters of the site. And we've also circulated all of the agencies required to be uh, circulated. So today, as of today, we have not received any phone calls or written comments other than the two written comments received in the addendum, which is Enbridge Gas, that they have absolutely no concerns. And Orca Region Conservation Authority outlined their uh, request for the hazard lands to be zoned to environmental protection, which we've done. So the conclusion, the zoning bylaw amendment, if it's passed today, has a 20 day appeal period. And if no appeals are received, August 14th, the zoning bylaw amendment will be final and binding. And you can all uh, receive the addendum. And so that is my report is just due to the timing of receiving those comments. And uh, we've already taken care of that. Instead of delaying this for several months and redoing the whole thing, we've just acted really fast, got this done to satisfy uh, ORCA. And so everything should Very be good. Time and if there's any, uh, uh questions i'd be happy to ask or answer them uh go ahead Councilor. yeah thank you for you mayor um and thank you for um addressing the autonomy regional conservation authority that was the written record that was added that was sort of like my questions about the rezoning that was happening there uh but my my question is 
Um, are you finding that the comments back from, say, Enbridge or Autonomy Regional Conservation are getting like later and later for you to put together these packages to get your job finished? Like, it seems like the comments came in very late for this. Um, I'd say 90% of all comments that came into us was uh, the out of the office. Yeah. No comment. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, like Bell and all the rest of them, yeah. they, they they comment with no comment right. out of the office. Everybody's on holidays, possibly the yeah, last week of July or really late, right? the few and, weeks of July. Yeah, I was just wondering how hard a major job of when reports and comments come in this late. Most of them have, uh, from all, through you, Mary, most of the comments now from the agencies have fallen off where they usually would have replied before and say they have no concerns. Right. Now they're most of them. If they don't have any concerns, they don't even bother contacting us. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Law. One question for you in there. Uh, in the environmental protection zone, and is that really more of a concern if there's a building put on there? Like from a farming perspective, is there any issue of them hardly farming up to the EP zone or can you farm in the EP zone? Yes, through yes. Usener. You can actually farm in the EP zone, but you cannot and have agricultural uses. You just cannot have structures. Okay. The only structures permitted would be for uh, flood uh, retainment or trying to protect some flooded area or something. But no buildings would be allowed in the EP zone. Thank you. Um, for the record of the meeting, I'll now ask if there's anybody or persons in attendance to speak in support or opposition of this application, which I don't see anybody here, so we don't have to really worry about that. Um, and I need to see my piece. Okay, you can see your piece now. Thank you. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Asphodel, Norway, before the bylaw is passed, the person or public meeting is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Township of Asphodel, Norway to the Ontario Land Tribunal. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Asphodel, Norway, before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Ontario Land Tribunal, unless in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. Thank you. Um, I'll read out the recommended motion and ask for a mover and seconder that the Council of the Township of Asphodel Norwood accepts this report regarding CBLA-01-2023 Crowley for information and further that the Council of the Township of Asphodel Norwood direct staff to prepare a bylaw that will rezone the subject lands to agricultural exemption one zone A1 environmental protection EP zone and to the rural residential or ours. And I have a mover, Councillor Ward, Councillor Hodge Greaves. Any questions of Ed or anybody? No. All in favor? That motion's carried. Um, and now I'll ask for a motion. Motion to adjourn, adjourn. the public meeting and yeah. reconvene the regular meeting in council. All right, can I have a motion? Uh, Deputy Mayor Burke and Councillor Hodge agrees. All in favor? And a word to and our final and our final staff report our can the management action list. Candace, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Mayor. So you can see that coming up on the 15th of August, um, there is another regular meeting of the council that is being added. We're going to have a presentation from Watson and Associates in regards to the water and sanitary connection fees. Um, Development charges bylaw for 20 is up in December 31st of 2023. Um, the five year bylaw is up. Um, we don't include water and sanitary in our development charges bylaw. We keep it in a separate fees and charges bylaw. So 
although we're doing our DCs, we have to take a look at water and sanity because of the growth. So it's in a separate uh, fee structure. So we're dealing with that first, and then we're actually having our kickoff meeting uh, for DCs tomorrow. Management team is with Watsons as well. So just getting this connection piece taken care of. So essentially, it's going to be the piece that's going to reimburse the township on a per unit building permit basis for mm -hmm. all of the upgrades that are required on the sanitary side. The sanitary draft connection fee is substantially larger than the water piece, which because we're a groundwater source, our um, the cost of treating and producing our water is a lot different than say if we lived on the Trent and we had to do a surface water treatment plant and they tend to be closer. The water sanitary connection fees tend to be more par in those municipalities. Um, so Watkins is coming to do that presentation. Um, to kind of loop into that conversation, we felt it was important to have um, the RFP results to hire the consulting engineer to take on the first step of those sanitary upgrades as part of that puzzle. So to kind of build a story here. Um, and then of course we've retendered the, the sidewalks. Uh, so that'll be coming back as well as the other piece to this puzzle that's coming that's not on the action list that I just received yesterday is the draft logos for the water tower. So that's going to be coming forward to council for you guys to take a look at a few options as to what it looks like if you need to get uh, that back to the contractor to get it into, into the queue. Um, then after that, we have August 29th. Um, going to see a few things. Cost apportionment agreement with ORCA is for category three expenses. Um, and basically that's about, um, the levy is about $900 a year for us for the category three expenses, basically climate change initiatives, uh, watershed monitoring program in the tree of the seedling program. Um, but under the new reg, um, all category three expenses are to be a separate agreement uh, with ORCA to do that. So that's coming forward on the 29th as long as I um, get the memo that I've requested from ORCA staff in time. Uh, landfill closure tender results. The landfill closure tender is out. Um, we'll see how that goes. Hopefully it'll come on the 29th. If not, it'll be the 12th of September. Um, you kind of see the other stuff that's uh, going on there. We're just getting ready to, to trigger the, the tender for the six line culvert. It's been an interesting conversation with the engineers in regards to that. So. Um, I don't know if council remembers, but MTO had culverts uh, in a yard that we had found. Yeah. Um, once we got the, um, because of the span, it has to have a structural engineering design accompanied before we can construct. Uh, the structural engineers do not like the length of the culverts um, because there has to be, lack of a better word, bands that go around the culverts to put them together because. They're not long enough, which is probably why they're sitting in the MTO right. yard to begin with. Um, and that section of road is wide enough to handle all the agricultural equipment in that area. And it's a surface treated road, so it's wider. So the culverts need to be a certain length. So they need to be banded together. And that creates, obviously, a, a point of structural weakness. And they're not happy where that point is in the location of the road. So there's two options that we're looking at right now is either, well, it'll have to be either a box culvert are going to a larger, substantially larger still culvert, which is labor intensive to construct and put together. So I've, I've asked Peter to ask the engineers to take a look at it and see if we could tender both options at the same time, um, because I would like to just see the cost of both of those options, because to be honest, if the structure engineer signs off, I don't, either option is irrelevant to us, really, as long as structurally it can, it's sound. So that's where we're at with that project. Um, back of tender results, um, we have became a, become a member of Canoe Procurement. We have added that up to our website. So that group purchasing a program across Canada that's under uh, Local Authority Services, LAS. And they have actually done all the procurement uh, for backhoes, which means we don't have to do our own procurement process. We can actually tag onto their procurement and there is um, significant savings there. Um, so you'll see the staff report coming forward as to what that process has been like for us. It's the first time that we're using it. And we're going to uh, try to choose the backhoe um, as our first kick at the can on that. Um, is that a new service that's available? Or just it's fairly new to Ontario. Um, it started in the West and it's migrating, uh, migrating to the East. 
migrating to the east. But um, so they basically, we just have to put legally, we have to put something up on our website, on our procurement page to state that we um, are going to participate in a group purchasing program. Our bylaw allows us to participate in group purchasing procurements because we do it with the county. County-wide is a group purchasing effort as well. So whether it's Canada-wide, province-wide, county-wide, they're all group purchasing efforts. So our bylaw allows it. We put it up on the website. We're going to see how it goes. So essentially, we have this membership number. We can reach out to our local uh, backhoe provider, give that information. They are then tied to the bid that they gave to the LAS group purchasing power. So we get the price that they submitted Canada-wide. So when you're talking that, you you know, numbers is power, right? And it draws the cost down. So even if it saves us a few thousand dollars, like three, four, five thousand, and then we didn't have to go through the procurement exercise, all in all, it was it was worth it. So um, we're still in the midst of, of that process. So um, stay tuned for the final results of that. Um, the RFP and people are reaching out to get the package for the master facilities plan is out. So we're waiting to see on that and we'll be able to report report back to to council likely on september 12th because i don't think it goes to the 29th but okay that's it for me uh one question just make sure peter has asked the engineers because sometimes you can throw something different at them um, with the culvert that's going through there they don't like where the banding is going to be I sh i'm sure that he has said okay we'll shorten the culvert up so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he's gone we've had all of those that. we've had all of those conversations and make yeah. sure that it's not exactly what the wheels are going to be going on <laughs> just engineers yes yeah. yes sorry block culvert would be the cement cement the yeah 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 so you know Box culvert, you're probably looking at 200,000. We have 185,000 in the budget, um, but that, so 200,000 just for the culvert alone. And that's the estimate guaranteed when we go to tender. I'm betting it'll be 220, 225 plus engineering. We're going to be sitting at 240, so we're at about 55,000 over budget. Um, so that is why we're tendering both options, um, as well as still working with the engineers, but just we haven't landed. On and anything just yet. So with that box folder, is that one that's already precast? It's already poured, or is that building one like is uh, I suspect it would be precast. Because precast, yeah. Yeah. That, For one that because I mean in the box in culvert world, rural culverts, it's large, but in box box culvert world, it's, it's yeah. Yeah. So um I suspect it would be uh precast. Obviously, we're gonna have to close the road and yeah, um, it's gonna be open from one side to the other. We'll have to be Good communication, but we got to get through the engineering and the procurement before we worry about construction. And so we've got a few hoops to a few hoops to jump through. And it, it, we've had five uh, culverts fail um, prematurely in the last month. We are going to have to spend between beaver cones and culverts about thirty thousand um, dollars in the next. Um, couple of months to deal with culverts. As of right now, we, on a couple of culverts, we have literally street signs over top of them upside down, covering them up. So we've got the culverts on order waiting to win and it wasn't in budget because they shouldn't have failed. It's climate so, change, it's a storm. Uh, it's the, mm -hmm. the heavy rain. The heavy rain. Around, short period of time everything. Well, and exactly, when that's a management plan were created back in 2013, when we went through that exercise, all of those rural, culverts weren't itemized individually. And back then, the cost of those culverts weren't considered capital in nature. Uh -huh. That has long changed. The game has completely changed. We have a culvert just north of, yeah, just north of this one that we're talking about in the sixth line. It's two and a half, two, over two feet in diameter. It's another large culvert. Um, it's failing with one in the 12th, one in the 11th, one in the 10th, and we have roadsides turned upside down waiting for the culverts to come in. But our budget for culverts traditionally is five to 10,000. We're going to spend 30,000 in the next two months for culverts that have just failed prematurely on these gravel roads. And and we're just praying we don't see a storm yeah. between before we get these culverts in. Um, so there's going to be a shift in the budget in 2024 as items that you've traditionally seen in the operational budget side of things that are going to be switching over to the capital budget um, that are no longer considered operational. Um, the, the, the 
ticket price is too high to consider them operational. They're not staying less than the 5,000 anymore per each. So good news all around. Yeah, good news. Um, motion that council accepts this report and the revisions suggested by the CAO or treasurer and member of the council, Councillor Walt, Councillor War. All in favor? Motion's carried. On to correspondence for action, C5. Town of Alton Hills, reducing municipal insurance costs. What's council's wishes? Second, C5. Councillor, or Deputy Member. Uh, with this one, I would uh, support talking about insurance rates here forever. And uh, yeah, definitely support this. Moved by Count or Deputy Mayor Bird, uh, second by Osh Greaves. Any more discussion? All in favor? Motion to carry. Uh, uh, town of uh, Caledon, uh, C6, Town of Caledon, illegal land use enforcement update. What's Council's wishes for C6? Uh, um, to receive. To receive. Yeah. Uh, received by Councillor Roar, second by Councillor Walsh. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? That motion's carried. <laughs> Councillor Liaison reports. Uh, does anyone have anything they would like to bring forward besides what I've read? <laughs> no? Okay. Clerk Treasurer List. Um, so the nurse practitioner um, has started uh, light duties and hopefully will be seeing patients next week, Tuesdays and Thursdays at um, the medical center and a press release will be going out to support that um, once the executive director at the work on the team has supported uh, the wording of the press release, it'll go out and I'll send it out to council. Okay. The water tower um, construction, the foundation is all almost complete. So it's um, all the geotech work has been done. They basically dug out the foundation and repacked in the new granular material. So the size of that hole beside the existing tower, staff is very grateful that that hole is now filled back <laughs> in. Filled back in, very grateful. Um, Construction's about two weeks behind, um, but we're still going to be up and running by the the uh, end of the year. The, the tower is on its way from England. Um, so I'm on uh, my thought, uh, my 3 a.m. thought was all of the ports that have been shut down in Nova Scotia due to the last storm. I just hope that our tower isn't headed to Nova Scotia. Um, but I'll be so <laughs> abreast of that because their port has basically been shut down and it's all like backed up. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Vancouver be worse. Yeah. yeah, very true. Very true. Um, that's it for me. That's it. Yeah. Uh, general business. Uh, we have any further up that we I just. Got a few things. Just a reminder to Council on um, Sunday, August 13th, is a uh, the Norman Fair kickoff, 2 p.m. Norman Fair Ambassador um, in this room. And it's the 10th, also the 15th anniversary. And I will make you know that Councillor Ward's served as the very first ambassador of the Norman Fair. So, uh, yeah, something. Um, second thing, the Pro Egg Roundtable, we're hosting the farm tour again on Thursday, September 28th. We, you will be getting an email. I think they may be coming through the clerk's office to be distributed. Um, September 28th, 9 to 2.30 um, for local council members, planning staff, that sort of thing, MPs, MPs. Um, we are only taking one bus. So if you see that and you want to go, please sign up. It will be through an online uh, what's event, event for right? I believe yeah. is what it will be through. And um, there will be three stops this year, and um, they're fairly local, so a lot less traveling um, this year. So, so looking forward to that. And then, um, 
the other was talking about the breakfast, but I'll let you bring that up about our council member. So that's interesting. Council Wall, uh, really just a pass on the rest of council. I was actually at the Shamrock Festival on the weekend, and the uh, Canadian Mental Health Mobile Wellness Bus was there. Um, so those of you who maybe aren't aware, that mobile bus actually is in Norwood. Usually, it really sits out in the spot lot uh, every other week. Um, they are seeing between eight to nine clients every time they're here on um, every two weeks, and. Uh, Jenna Hancock, who I spoke to, said there's about a six to seven week assessment lead time for our area. So, also, you know, it's awesome that we have that service available. And obviously, by the sounds of it, it's needed. So, just want to pass that along with that, that mental health bus, which is a pilot project, was being well used. Councilor Warren? Um, yes, just two things. Um, first, um, I think this was in our tax recent tax bill uh, for the new um, newsletter. And I just want to um, give a, a shout out to staff. It's jam packed full of information if anyone hasn't had a chance. But one thing that I wanted to point out, um, they've included the what three words, and that's um, a lot of an app you can download to your phone. So if you're lost or in trouble, you know, if you're a farmer in a field and um, when I was talking to our, our fire chief, he said it goes on a grid and it can track you on by your phone within uh, two to three meters of where you were are. And I guess recently, I believe down in Northumberland County, they walked somebody out that was lost at hiking and they walked them out using this app. So they didn't have to send uh, anybody in that might, you know, be in danger for whoever is looking for them. So uh, thank you for adding that. I think that and the Emily project, you know, was, that's another one that, you know, uh, identifies land. I just, want that. just a question on that. Is that the sheet with the date of the Santa Claus parade on it? The Santa Claus parade, and uh, it has it listed as December 4th. That's I think the last, that's wrong. It's the last Saturday in our, our and then November. November last yeah. Well, the correction for that, but Just, otherwise, well yeah, done. Well done. <laughs> yes. And the second one was um, about the business uh, uh, advisory committee, and if there was any appetite at the council table to participate in a council breakfast for the business community, um, and in, and I will leave that up to Candace and staff. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, so as members of the Peterborough Fourth Chamber of Commerce, they came and did a presentation at our business advisory committee meeting. And one of the events that they sponsor and provide to the business community is they call it a mayor or councillor breakfast. And they invite um, the business community to come forward. They have educational opportunities, whether that's through community futures, as uh, Deputy Member was speaking about earlier in our meeting today, um, through Peterborough Fourth Economic Development, all of those types of organizations that locally provide support to businesses. They can have them come speak to the businesses. Um, council can be there and have an opportunity to speak to the local business community in a um, deliberate but informal setting if that makes sense and just wondering what the appetite would be around the council table to support the committee and uh, the chamber in that initiative and putting forward some dates obviously it has to work for the chamber as well um those dates but whether if we could just get maybe um if council supports it great and then we can maybe work on some dates between the chamber the committee and, and council um that would be lovely all right um, yeah, when I saw that, I thought, wow, what a really great idea. So I didn't realize where it was, where it was uh, coming from. So no, I think that's great. Um, I think when you, you take a look at dates, because we also want to include our farm businesses as well, it might be important to do it, you know, maybe after a busy harvest season. So, mm -hmm. you know, late October, early November might be, might be a really good time or, you know, even in the winter, but you, you really do want to target those farm businesses and you're not going to get them September, October. Mm -hmm. um, you're just not. So just something to, to keep in mind when we're looking at dates. I don't know how much lead time we need, but that's just my thought. Right. Well, if, I, if I may add something else to that, um, because we, you know, we we're talking about a farmer's market there, and there's a survey that's going to go out from, uh, well, we'll it's out that. now. Oh, it's out now. 25 responses so far. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a business survey that's gone out with initiatives that the, uh, 
the committee has come up with. Right. And so we'll have that data as well to be able to present out of breakfast, um, you know, to see where things are going and what, you know, the business community uh, feels is needed too. So I agree, uh, possibly a late October after the fair, yeah, uh, you know, it, it might be a good time to have something like this. Yeah. Anything else? Sure. I can just basically uh, echo what Councilor Warren and Deputy Mayor Bird said. It's a great opportunity to, to meet with local businesses. I like the formal and formal approach to it. Um, first hand, it's nice to have all of us there because everybody has their personal, their most comfortable to go talk to. So, yeah. um, it's a great opportunity to have that connection. Right. Now, when you're talking businesses, are you talking organizations too, or just businesses? Just businesses, okay. just businesses okay. at this time. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we do organizations that showcase. All right. Um, and touch base with them. Um, at that point in time, just they're ran by volunteers sure. with struggles, and we find when you mix those two together, when you have community futures and stuff coming, there's often miscommunications too, because those organizations aren't eligible under those programs. Okay. So we try to keep it just to the those that are eligible to receive money. But I do have a couple of one more thing in general business, if that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. So do we need to make a motion on that or no? Uh, or that we're in support of that? Or it's just that we'll just go ahead. We can have a motion if you want. Sure, sure. And we can take it back to the committee formally. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, um, Councillor War, you brought it up. Okay, that, that <laughs> I propose that um, the council participates in um, uh, council breakfast with the business community. Um, future date to be determined um, by our CAO. The later fall. And in details. Second by Deputy Mayor Burt. All in favor? That motion's carried. <clears throat> Now, general business, yes, or no? One other thing. So, well, actually, two things about during the same way. Um, so, as the township is in partnership with the library and township staff has been working on the communications for the community scavenger hunt that is taking um, place on Saturday, August 19th. I will leave um, one of these pamphlets um, for you that details all of the, you know, the different points and um, what people can do, et cetera, with it. Um, it's very exciting. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. So hopefully um, everyone can you know, spread the word. I think it's gonna be a great initiative, as well as Township staff has been working on um, a fundraiser to raise money for equipment to support the new doctors in the new medical center. Um, and we are on October 27th going to be hosting a murder mystery night gala, a gala event. It's going to have a meal. There's going to be sponsorship. People will be able to purchase tables, et cetera, in order to um, fundraise to purchase equipment for uh, the new medical center for our new doctors that are coming. So, so I just wanted to highlight those two dates. So August 19th, get up and out with the family. And then October 27th, um, date night. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, ma'am. Thank That's you. October 27th. Yeah. So we do not have any closed session today. None that I've noticed. There is no notice of motion. So we're on the bylaws. And uh, would you like to proceed, please? Mm -hmm. Uh, being a bylaw. Thanks. Being a bylaw to amend bylaw 2017 05, being a bylaw for the regulation of traffic and parking on highways and roadways within the jurisdiction of the Township of Aspidal, Norwood, be read a first, second, and third time in bylaw number 2023 39. Moved by Councillor Walsh. Second by Councillor Hodge Grees. Any discussion? All in favor? Motions carried. Being a bylaw to appoint a building inspector, property standards officer, bylaw enforcement officer, and livestock evaluator for the Township of Aspidel, Norwood, be read a first, second, and third time in numbered bylaw 2023 40. Moved by Deputy Mayor Bird. Second by Councillor War. Any discussion? All in favor? Motions carried.
being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 2009-08 as amended, being a bylaw to regulate the use of land and the use and erection of buildings and structures within the township of Asphodel, Norwood, be read a first, second, and third time in numbered bylaw 2023-41. Moved by Councillor War, second by Deputy Mayor Bird. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion's carried. Being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the regular meeting of the Council of the Township of Aspidal, Norwood, held July 25th, 2023, be read at the first, second, and third time in numbered bylaw 2023-42. Moved by Councillor War, second by Councillor Walsh. Any discussion? Motion. All in favor? Motion's carried. So the bylaws. And now the best motion. <laughs> Not really, but anyway. Can I have a motion for adjournment? And the future meeting schedule is before you. And it's we'll adjourn the meeting of July 25th here right now at the time of 239. 2.39. With council to meet at the regular meeting on August 15th at 2 p.m. or at the call of the chair. Move by Councillor Walsh. Sorry, I just as a, the August 22nd is the 29th. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I will second the motion to adjourn. Right. So it is the 29th. It is the 29th, 29th. Yeah. like you said. Yeah. Okay. All in favor of that? That motion is carried.